Hello strangers, it's been quite a while since my last video. I really haven't been doing much reading lately and other things have just been getting in the way. And then about two, three weeks ago, I decided to finally sit down and make a video and my microphone wasn't working. <laughs> and so I had to get a new microphone and a new camera, which I now have. And I'm finally able to make content again. The microphone currently doesn't have a stand, so hopefully this sounds all right. Bit of a work in progress, but well, we'll get there, but I really wanted to get a new couple of new videos in before the new year. And so today I'm going to be doing a reading vlog. I have been reading again lately, so I've got a few books that I'd like to talk about. First on the list, we have Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. Brideshead Revisited is told by Charles Ryder, and it covers his life from his university days when he meets Sebastian, a young aristocratic man, and he ends up in a complicated relationship with Sebastian, and then he meets Sebastian's aristocratic family, and their relationship goes sour, and the novel explores the different kinds of love that come into Charles's life. The novel delves into all kinds of things, whether it's the fall of the aristocracy, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's different kinds of love, whether it's love in friendship, or maybe more <laughs> uh, than friendship, romantic love, and love of God. And throughout all of this, you have the backdrop of the interwar period, when we meet Charles at the beginning, I think we're in the late 20s or so, and throughout most of the early part of the novel, there's this wonderful nostalgia and uh, sort of brightness to it, and then as the war creeps in, things become a lot more bleak. This is a book that's been on my reading list for a long time. I've just never managed to get around to reading it, and I'm really glad that I finally did. It's such a fantastic book, and there's so much to engage with. Even Moore has beautiful prose, very complicated and oftentimes funny characters, and he's really good at crafting the different kinds of relationships, especially the relationship between Charles and Sebastian, which, even though it only takes up about a third or so of the novel, is probably the centerpiece of the story. Charles and Sebastian have a very deep relationship, possibly a romantic relationship, and maybe more. And it really is just the highlight of the novel, this very deep friendship between these two men. And it's quite tragic to watch this fall apart as Charles meets Sebastian's family, and Sebastian sort of grows jealous of Charles, getting involved with his family, and Charles, his loyalties seeming to come apart away from Sebastian and move towards other members of the family. If you like novels that are set in universities, if you like Dark Academia, for example, then I think you will like uh, Brideshead Revisited. I wouldn't quite say it is Dark Academia because the university passages are actually some of the uh, most uh, you know, beautiful passages of the story. Things are generally a lot happier when they're at university and it's when they leave that things become much sadder. The book has a much more idealised sense of university life. It's something that Charles as a character looks back on really fondly because it's when his friendship with Sebastian was at its most powerful. But there is more to this story as well than just this friendship and the coming of age of Charles at his university. Another big theme in the story is Catholicism and it's something that really creeps into the story unexpectedly because it doesn't really, it's not really in the story at all much at the beginning, it's just something that comes up in debates every now and then between Charles and Sebastian's family because they're all Catholics of varying degrees of commitment but as the story progresses it becomes clear that this is meant to be a big theme and many people argue that the story is actually kind of a progression of three different stages of love beginning with the kind of platonic brother love between Sebastian and Charles, moving to the more romantic love that we get with Julia and Charles, and then finally forsaking all material love and moving towards love of God. Some people find the ending of the story not very compelling, because Charles, who seems to be, he's described as agnostic throughout the story, but he comes across as more atheistic. Um, he suddenly converts at the end of the story, and this is seen by some as, a, as something that's not particularly believable. And I have to say, I did find that on my first read of the book as well. I, I just didn't really buy his conversion at the end. But this is something that I'm going to go into in my more in-depth discussion of Brideshead, because I think there's a lot to unpack just in terms of the religious themes, but also in terms of Charles and Sebastian and what is really going on with their relationship as well. But definitely a great story. I'm really glad that I finally got around to reading it. Next, we have another story that's set in a university, and it's The Longest Journey by E.M. Forster. The Longest Journey revolves around Ricky Elliott, a young university man who has many ideals and wants to be an artist, and he struggles as he transitions from his university life to that thing that lots of people call the real world to maintain his ideals and his artistic ambitions as things like his wife start to impinge on him and encourage him to be more practical and to sort of forsake his ideals. 
Another book that's been on my reading list for a while as well. I'm slowly working my way through all of Forster's books. I think I only have his first novel to read now and then I've got all of them. So maybe I'll do a ranking video on Forster's works at some point in the future. But I may have to read some of his books again first before I do that. In any case, The Longest Journey is a very interesting book in Forster's bibliography because it's not like any other book that he wrote. It's quite philosophical in that it engages a lot with you know, what it means to live a good life, whether that means living by your ideals or forsaking that to be a more pragmatic person or finding some path between them. It's not really about romance in a way that a lot of Forster's books typically have a romance at the heart of them. And it just, even the style is just very different. It, it kind of comes across a lot more modernist than a lot of his other books, which are told in a much more um, straight way. Falster also said that of his novels, this is the one that he was most proud, I think, to have written. And you can sort of see why, in a, in a sense, because it does seem distinctively him. It's one of those books where it's not obvious that it could have come from anyone else. Falster was someone who was homosexual, but lived his whole life more or less in the closet, except for coming out to a few of his friends. He was someone who had ideals, but I think he was also quite a sickly person. And so you can feel that coming across in the character of Ricky Elliott, someone with artistic ambitions, someone who really wants to connect with the world, but for some reason feels incapable of doing so. All of that stuff seems reflected in Forster's character, which again is quite different from some of, his, some of his other books, which don't seem as obviously autobiographical, except maybe, of course, Morris. Again, university here is portrayed as a kind of idealised paradise to some extent. Uh, when Ricky is there, he's at his happiest, and his friendships there all have this wonderful idealised uh, feeling as well. And it's only really when he leaves university and the horrors of real life uh, hit him in the face that things start to fall apart. And I think that's something that many people can relate to, whether that's university or maybe even just school. There's something about those years and, and those times where you have a certain kind of freedom that you lose when you enter that, that thing that people call the real world. And so it does a really good job of capturing that transition. Another thing that I liked was how Forster deals with this tension between ideals and reality, because there's a tendency, I think, for people to think that if you're into academic pursuits or the arts, that you're meant to sort of detach yourself completely from ordinary material concerns, uh, and then you end up being quite eccentric and strange, uh, and Forster seems quite against that. Uh, one of the criticisms of Ricky's work, his writing in, in the book, is that it doesn't connect with real things. It's sort of ephemeral and out there. And Forster seems very on the idea that you really should connect um, your ideals to reality. But at the same time, we have the character of Agnes, who is Ricky's wife, and she is too pragmatic um, to the point where she does some things that are pretty dodgy just so that she can inherit, just so that she can do things like inherit money. So again, you've got to be somewhere between these two sides. I also found the book quite maybe unintentionally funny, I'm not sure, because it has one of the most bizarre deaths uh, I've ever read in a book. And Forster is quite good at bizarre deaths. In Howard's End, one of the characters dies when a bookshelf falls on him, which, again, it just seems a bit strange. Uh, and it's not a very big bookshelf, if I remember, either. And in this book, we have an even more ridiculous death where someone dies having had a football accident. Now, I have no idea what a football accident could involve, uh, and the story doesn't go into details, probably because it's so absurd. Uh, and I think, and I wonder to some extent if, if this was a deliberate choice, if Foster was aware of this being slightly silly. But it does seem that one of the themes of this book is the fragility of life and how quickly it can be taken away. Even people who come across as quite, you know, strong and powerful, even these people can just be broken like twigs at any moment. And that really does come out a few times in this story where there is, there are quite a number of deaths in the story and some of them are even some of them are quite bloody as well uh, surprisingly for, for a Forster book in any case if you're familiar with Forster and you want a book that you probably haven't read of his I would definitely pick The Longest Journey it's definitely an underrated book and it's just a very interesting one it's got the philosophical stuff it's got some maybe unintentionally funny stuff and it's just a very engaging book to read Next up we have Babel by R.F. Kwong. Now this is a new book and it was published maybe this or last year and it was kind of an impulse buy when I was in Oxford, which is where this book is set. It's also set at Oxford University. There seems to be a recurring theme in my reading at the moment. I have no idea why, but this time it's set, I think, in the Victorian period. I haven't read much of this book, maybe just about three chapters, so I'm only going to summarise the parts that I've read. So we have an orphan boy who comes from Canton in China, who is the last survivor of his family who have all died from some kind of plague. This boy expects that he's going to die as well when he is rescued by a man called Robert Lovell, 
who takes him in and takes him back to England for his education and gives him the English name Robin. I'm at the point of the novel now where Robin is just about to go to Oxford University and begin his academic career. This is an interesting choice for me because I typically don't buy books on impulse. I typically think a lot about whether I'll enjoy it a lot and I'm quite good at guessing whether I like a book uh, based on the cover. I know you're not supposed to do that, but I do. And by cover here, I also mean the, the blurb and just things that I know about it. But generally speaking, I'm quite good at knowing if I'm going to enjoy a book. So if I buy something on impulse, it's, you know, it, it's a roulette game. And I'm ambivalent yet with this one. There are some parts of this book that I really enjoy. I like the atmosphere. I think that's really well done. There's some bits about language and the differences between language across cultures that I think is really good. Um, and I like the story. There's a lot of mystery so far. Um, for example, why exactly did this guy take Robin all the way from China? There's implications of maybe a paternal thing here, like illegitimate son, but it's nothing's concrete yet, so we'll see how that goes. But there's a lot that I like about this book, and I'm looking forward to reading more. That said, there are some aspects of the book that I am finding irritating. Mainly that's the messaging uh, that the book has. And that's not so much that the book has a message, it's the way that it, you know, takes every opportunity to just portray that message in ways that are just not very artistic and that sometimes break the story and your, and your ability to connect with the story. And some of these things are going to come across as quite nitpicky, but I'm just quite hypersensitive to moralizing in fiction because it's my main uh, bugbear. I think it's just bad pretty much across the board. So <laughs> it's something that I'm always quite sensitive to. So here's one example of this. We have Robin and there's a kind of a long passage where he's discussing his upbringing now in London and making comparisons between it and China. Obviously a part of this is him then reading the literature of his day and forming his views on it. No problem there, that makes perfect sense for a character to do that. And he comes across Dickens and he said, and he reads the Pickwick Papers and there's a line that says something to the effect of, I found Dickens very funny but he clearly hates anyone that's non-white. And one, this just sounds like it's coming out of the mouth of someone from this year, not uh, from the time period at which this book was written. So I find that kind of irritating. But more importantly, it's just not obvious how exactly uh, someone who's reading the Pickwick Papers would be able to draw that conclusion, given that all of the characters, I think, in the Pickwick Papers are white. Uh, so it's not obvious why you would be able to draw that inference, since most of the books in England at the time will have also just had predominantly, if not totally white, uh, cast. So to just sort of put that as your main um, so to put that as your main criticism just seems bizarre. And you can just tell it's the author just imposing what they know about Dickens into this character's mouth. Now we do know that Dickens' views on race were complicated. It's not clear that the view that he didn't like anyone non-white is true, because uh, he wrote things about, you know, against slavery and things. But he also did have some, you know, not great views to have. So there's something there that you could make a point, you could be interesting and subtle about it perhaps. Uh, but the author didn't choose to, to do that, uh, and instead just chose to be quite obvious and blunt and it's not believable because why would Robin know this? Most of what Dickens said about race doesn't really come from his books per se, it comes from his private correspondence. Now there are exceptions to this, things like the publication of Oliver Twist for example, but in the context of this passage Robin is talking about Dickens Pickwick papers and Robin presumably hasn't read all of Dickens private correspondence and since Robin doesn't seem to like Dickens all that much it's not even that believable that he would have read other books by Dickens either. So it's just an example of how the author wants to say something about a leading cultural figure in England, i.e. that he's racist, and shoves that in a character's mouth, but doesn't do that in a way that's believable in the story that they're telling from the perspective of the character who has this alleged opinion. So this is an example, I think, of moralizing that just really irritates me because it just breaks the rules of storytelling uh, and it just is obviously the author's opinion coming through a character. Another example of this sort of thing that's not really a moralizing thing, it's more just um, f a failure to understand how a certain thing that you say can contradict something later in the story. There's a scene in which Robert Lovell severely beats Robin uh, for reading a book when he should be doing something else and it's quite a you know brutal scene quite effective in, in that sense but there's again this line that says that you know he knew exactly where to hit robin such that no one would know where the bruises were but he also hits him in the face and then everyone later on recognizes this and there's sort of a whole thing here about how you know people see children getting beaten and don't do anything about it which is true for the time and not breaking the rules of the story at all kids just did get treated quite badly back then but again it contradicts that first line because if he's 
so interested in beating Robin to the, the sort of in this hidden way, why would he have struck him on the face? So again, it's just this example of contradictions. And these are just small points. They really are small points, but they bug me. The moralistic thing bugs me more because I'm worried that it might become more egregious as the book progresses. But we'll see. Uh, maybe it won't. Maybe it will just be these little things, in which case I think I'll still enjoy the book a lot. And as I said, there's a lot of mystery in the book. There's a great atmosphere to the story that's being told. And I'm looking forward to seeing how Robin engages culturally with uh, being at Oxford at this time when he really is, you know, basically a minority of one or, you know, a handful uh, of people. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the author deals with all of that stuff going forward. Next, we have Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. I've been watching the Shakespeare plays with my partner now. We've got through quite a good chunk of them now, and we're now on to this play, which we always sort of take a deep breath before we watch a Shakespeare comedy, especially my partner, because he's not really a fan of the comedies at all. But this one we both enjoyed a lot, probably is our favourite comedy jointly, because it actually manages to be quite entertaining, and it's not too long for a Shakespeare play. The play is set in the Sicilian town of Messina, and it revolves around the romantic lives of two couples. The main couple being Beatrice and Benedict, who have a sort of fiery relationship with each other. They don't seem to like each other very much, but perhaps there's love bubbling underneath the surface. And we also have a more conventional love relationship between Hero and Claudio, a young soldier. The play reminded me a little bit of The Taming of the Shrew, if The Taming of the Shrew was a bit more egalitarian and a bit more mature, uh, in that you have this sort of, you know, tempestuous uh, woman who's quite witty and biting uh, with a kind of Lothario type figure as well in Benedict and there's a lot of sparring between these two but as I said the play does end in a bit more of an egalitarian way and I would say probably favours Beatrice she tends to win the sparring that occurs between these two. I think what I like about this play in comparison to say other romantic comedies by Shakespeare is just the, the, the couple in this one just have a certain kind of gravitas that I think a lot of other of the main couples in Shakespeare comedies lack and I think that's because they just feel like older people. We know that Claudio is around 30 maybe 31, 32 I think or something like that and we don't know how old Beatrice is but she just comes across in the way that she speaks and engages with Benedict as a maturer woman. Not necessarily like 40 or something, but you know, maybe something like 28 to 30, which in the time period would have been considered a mature woman. And I think that just adds something deeper to the characters. There's also an implication that they have a history with each other as well, which again just adds something to the story that I think an edge that's missing in a lot of other Shakespeare comedies. If you compare these two to the other romantic couple in this one, you know, they don't compare. I quite like Hero and Claudio. They're a nice couple to have, but they're just not as interesting or compelling as Beatrice and Benedict. I, I would say the play actually reminded me a little bit of Jane Austen's novels, kind of like persuasion in some ways, because the characters have that, you know, that sort of maturity to them. But then also it's more like Pride and Prejudice, because it's mainly just wit uh, and banter throughout most of it. But that's not to say that it doesn't have deep themes. Hero gets quite a good speech because she's wrongly accused of cheating on Claudia at one point, and she has a pretty good speech against um, her lover who, who accuses her of this. Uh, and that's a really good part of the play, and it also adds a lot of stakes to the comedy as well, which I think is another reason why I enjoyed it. A lot of Shakespeare comedies can sometimes feel like there are no real stakes, so it really relies a lot on the atmosphere or the jokes or the characters, and if those things don't land, especially when you're watching a play, the whole thing can fall apart. But in this play you have some kind of stakes and that just adds something to the to the play and makes it more watchable in my view. As I've been watching the Shakespeare plays, I've also been reading Harold Bloom's book, uh, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, which I definitely recommend if you want to watch all of Shakespeare's plays or read all of his plays. Reading Bloom's essays on, he has one on each play in this book, uh, is a nice like companion piece to the plays. And he doesn't go into overly you know detail in terms of giving you a synopsis it's more like just getting his thoughts on the plays and with the bigger plays there are longer essays but sometimes his thoughts are quite short uh, if the play isn't one of Shakespeare's best but it's kind of like just you know watching a play and then talking about it with a very interesting friend and sometimes you agree and sometimes you disagree and I disagree with Bloom on Much Ado About Nothing because he doesn't really rate it much as a play you can see why it's popular but ultimately He's not much of a fan. Uh, and, I, and I wonder if that's just him being a little bit um, of a hipster when it comes to Shakespeare. Like, oh, that one's popular, therefore I don't like it. Um, but in any case, uh, he did have some interesting things to say, even if I didn't agree with him this time. And last on the list, we have a nonfiction book, A Common Faith by John Dewey. 
John Dewey is a philosopher and one that I've been reading a lot of recently. I read his book on aesthetics. I enjoyed that so much that I read it again and again. <laughs> and I may even read it again and maybe even do some kind of uh, synopsis or um, discussion of it on this channel at some point. But that will take a lot of work, so I'm not making any promises there. But I did read his book on a common faith in which he tries to argue that there is a kind of religious experience that you can have even if you're an atheist and you don't believe in any supernatural things and he thinks that it's a valuable kind of experience that everyone should have whether they believe in supernatural things or a particular religion or not. It's hard to pin down exactly what Dewey means by this religious experience uh, but the idea is that it's not something that's based on anything supernatural and instead it's just having a kind of faith in some kind of ideal and then the desire or commitment to realize that ideal in the real world. So it could be, for example, your fundamental commitment to equality or justice or your children or something. And you just have this unshakable faith that this thing is valuable, that it has potential, and you're going to commit to that thing and to manifesting that thing uh, as much as you can. And what I like about this is that it responds to something that I'm seeing a lot in you know, modern discourse about morality and ethics where religious people or apologists for religion will say things like, well, you know, if you're a secular person or an atheist, you can't ground your morality on anything because you need kind of the big God figure to do that for you. So you're either sneaking in God without being aware of it uh, or you're just basically standing on, you know, a set, trying to stand on water, basically. And obviously the news is going to sink. So I don't really like that argument. I've never really been convinced by it. I think, you know, the idea that the only way you can grab morality is to have some supernatural being waving a stick at you and threatening you with an eternal punishment if you don't do as you're told doesn't to me sound like a great way to ground morality not that i you know have any issues with people practicing religion or anything but i just don't find that argument very compelling and i think that ultimately yes everyone has commitments whether they're religious or moral or political or whatever or to people to, to family to friends to lovers that essentially can't be justified you know we can talk about them all day but ev eventually we just bottom out at something uh, and, and that is just your unshakable faith that, you know, it is good, uh, that equality is good, or that murdering people for fun is bad. Uh, and there's a point at which rationality and argumentation just doesn't work. That's just an unshakable commitment that you have. And I think that's what Dewey is trying to get at with this notion of secular religious experience. This idea that you can feel that towards something and you don't need to import all of the supernatural stuff. Uh, and that's something that really interests me because I often consider myself as... A spiritual person not that i believe in homeopathy or anything uh, but you know someone who feels connected to things that people will call religious experiences but i've never been uh, you know a believer in anything supernatural so i don't believe in ghosts i don't believe in auras or spirits or any of the gods uh, but nevertheless i do have that that feeling of spiritualness that i can't pinpoint exactly and so this book kind of captures my some of my feelings on that this idea that you can have those kinds of experiences without the need to import anything supernatural so if you're interested in those topics i would definitely recommend reading this book it's also very short about 80 pages it can be a bit dense at times but it, it's very interesting and worth reading all right that's everything that i've been reading this it would have been november but i'm just going to say this uh, early winter uh, and let me know in the comments what you've been reading in this very long period if you've read any of these books let me know what you think of them as well. I look forward to discussing all that with you in the comments. Take care, everyone. ta -ra.